Michael, you served a different president who was quite adept at taking a briefing in real time and interacting with you as you developed the story and asking you questions. That was not President Obama style. What's interesting to me, Robert, is there's a thread here. We integrated three of the most significant intelligence agencies to go do this. It turned out that I, and I suspect it would be almost the same for you, spent 1,440 hours in the sit room in those four years. You counted? Well, <laughs> we had to develop more insight because, in addition, President Obama kept demanding, rightfully, I need more evidence. What's going on inside that compound? This is Intelligence Matters with Michael Morrell, a joint production of the Cypherbrief.com and CBS News. I'm Cypherbrief CEO and publisher Suzanne Kelly. In this podcast, the former acting director of the CIA speaks with top leaders asking the right questions and making connections that provide deeper insight into complex security events. Because intelligence matters. Robert Cardillo is a career intelligence officer who rose through the ranks to a number of senior positions in the intelligence community. Robert is currently the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. I had the opportunity recently to sit down with Robert to talk about the importance of intelligence in today's world, about the critical role his agency plays keeping the country safe, and about his own very interesting career. This is Intelligence Matters, and I'm Michael Morrell. Robert, thank you for joining me on the show. It is very good to see you again. First place I'd like to go is to talk a little bit about you. How did you get in to the intelligence business? It's an interesting question. I'm an Army brat, so grew up from post to post around this country and in Europe. And for the longest time was convinced I was going to follow my father's footsteps. I was going to go to West Point, be a military officer, serve my country. And I can't remember the moment in high school that it pivoted. Uh, something about somebody telling you what to do every moment of every day and you having to salute smartly to anybody who outranked you, which would be everybody at the beginning that I, maybe there's another way for me to serve. And so while I got and was appreciative of my appointment to West Point, I decided to take a different path and went and studied government at Cornell. And matter of fact, saw it's it. a big decision not it to go to West Point. It once was you've a big been decision. Accepted. I give my father great credit for two reasons. One, who, what father doesn't want his son to follow in his footsteps, right? So I remember sitting at the kitchen table and we've got this appointment to West Point and this offer. From an Ivy League school? From Cornell. And you've got legacy and free. And you've got some Ivy League school and a really big bill. And he gave me great counsel, which I try to remember to this day when I'm trying to help my teammates. He said, you shouldn't go because you're not committed. And you'll end up coming home in six months and you'll be angry at me. So he saw that in you. He, he knew I wasn't fully in. And he said, you can't go if you're not fully in. That's West Point has a way to weed out those who aren't fully committed. And so, again, to this very day, I'm appreciative of his ability to step back from a personal preference and see inside something that I needed to hear. So I enjoyed my time in Ithaca for whatever reason. Maybe it was a movie. Maybe it was a book. I need to join the intelligence community. And I knew of one place. The Central Intelligence Agency. And so I went to Fort Myer Drive and filled out my little... Uh, Ames building? Yes, SF-171 or whatever it was, and began the process my junior year in college. And began a very long interview recruitment process, vetting and testing and all that. And then sometime, I guess, just early in my senior year, my father was in Washington when I was down doing an interview with Langley. And he said, well, why don't you apply to DIA? Was he still active duty at he that was. point? He was on a board at the time in the Pentagon. And he said, why don't you apply to DIA? And I said, just tell me what it stands for and I'll, I'll apply. I'm looking for a job. So I threw my name in the hat at Defense Intelligence Agency. They called in August. They had me at yes, you know, the, the first offer. I said, I can't imagine being able to spend $11,428 in my life. Can't believe you're going to give me this much to be a intelligence research specialist, parent, photographic interpreter. And so there it began. Yeah, my first salary was 15000 something. Yeah, so You were way overpaid. <laughs> <laughs> You've had some very interesting assignments, and I wanted to ask you about two of them in particular. From 2010 to 2014, you served as the Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Intelligence Integration. And that's a title only the U.S. government could come up with. Indeed. And I know you did a lot of things in that job, but two of the things that you did, one was to brief the president every morning 
um, or most mornings. And then the other was to represent the intelligence community at deputies meetings. Can you talk about the first one a little bit, Robert, in terms of what it's like to walk in the room every day, put the intelligence on the table for the president, answer his questions? Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Let me back up a little bit, though, Michael, because this is summer of 2010. Denny Blair had just left the position as of DNI. He was the third DNI. He left at a time that was the DNI was just about five years old and not under the best of circumstances. So there were a lot of questions about the position, the office. Is this experiment working out? Jim Clapper answered the call, said, I'll go out. He asked me to go with him. I first said no because I had just become the deputy director at DIA, that place that I had first joined as a junior officer, as I the senior that. civilian. I remember that. And I said, Jim, I can't go. I've just gotten the pinnacle of my civilian career in the defense intelligence enterprise. Civilian can't go any higher. Right. right. And Jim's a tough guy to say no to, but I did. So he waited like about four more weeks and decided not to ask me again, went to my boss and convinced my boss, Ron Burgess, it's in the best interest if Robert comes out and becomes this new long titled thing at ODNI. So I arrive in August. 2010. Jim was all about integration, right? Everything was about integration. He wanted to bring everything together so that all of the effort, all of the output of the IC could be forged in a way to have the greatest value. So he took what was two organizations, Deputy Director for Analysis, Deputy Director for Collection. And in Jim's colloquial way, he mushed them together. And he said, Robert, go figure out how to run those two things. So it was, it was quite a challenging opportunity I know you had Norm Rule on. Norm was a mission manager at the time. We evolved that term to national intelligence manager. But then we needed to stand up a number of other accounts to cover the globe because Jim didn't just want them for Iran and Korea, but for the entirety of the world. So that sets the stage. So that was my first job to do some task organization and some kind of bureaucratic management. And it turns out at the end of the day, that is exactly the right thing to do. Uh, Jim, I think so. Clapper, Jim Clapper nailed it. I think so. I mean, you can debate the numbers and the, and the accounts and whatnot. But, but the concept of bringing right. things together. Right. That does. And we were very purposeful about how we staffed those mission managers, the NIMS. We wanted to make sure that they had enough resources to macro manage, but not an extra resource to micromanage. We didn't want them doing the work. We had agencies and departments to do that. We, and I think that was broadly successful. But down to the White House, uh, the best way to explain my White House job is use the clock. At six o'clock in the evening or so, I would get the drafts for the next day's PDB, three to five articles, two to three pages each, and to do final review. And it's one threshold. So you're making a decision. The president needs to see this. He doesn't. If he needs to see it, this is the way it needs to be shaped, edited, presented. That's a six to eight to nine on a good night, six to 10 to 11 on a bad night, and six to midnight 1 a.m. is about cut off to get things printed in downtown. By the way, when I had that job, I always found it easier to do review after a glass of wine Indeed. than before. That has not changed. <laughs> or it didn't change under my tenure. I have no idea what the current team does. So that's the night, right? At whatever time, then, you get whatever hours of sleep you have, and then you show up at the executive office, old executive office building to prepare for the morning brief. And, you know, I've been told us a thousand times, it couldn't be more true. The most important letter in PDB is P. This president, in this case, President Obama, had a particular way to digest information. He was a reader. He studied. He would be intensely focused on whatever you put in front of him. So the press practice, and Michael, you had you served a different president who was quite adept at taking a briefing in real time and interacting with you as you develop the story and asking you questions. That was not President Obama style. So the book would go to him at 6 or 6.30 in the morning in his residence, and he would read it. So all the articles that we had edited and proved, he's got them. Then we show up at 9.30 for the president's daily brief, which isn't really the president's daily brief because he's done that. And we had to create what we ended up calling a walk-on brief, which meant was the way President Obama worked, he took what you told him, he digested it. Now, he, if he had questions, he would ask you, but mainly he was ready to move on. And so we would bring him, we called it connective tissue. Mr. President, yesterday you read about this issue in Central Africa. We just got a new piece of intelligence from the National Security Agency that it either advances the story or tells us we might not have had it exactly right, so we update him that way. Or two, if we're telling him something about like the Iranian nuclear program over time, bring in an expert who can dive him into the enrichment process so that he can fully understand the importance of centrifuges, et cetera. And so it was 
Because of that, the way he accepted and digested information, every day was a new production. And I've never been in television news, but it felt like you were every morning moving yellow stickies around to go, okay, the first minute we're going to cover this, the second minute that. When did you see the walk-on items in the morning? Yeah, I mean, there were there was always kind of a running list of items we might want to bring up, but we got serious the morning of. Overnight developments, social media, open source, all that fed into it. And when you say we, you had somebody helping you. That's correct. So the team that you would have been part of in your era who were working overnight preparing the morning brief would be there building a straw man for me. So that's the morning. Then 10, 10 30, I'm there just typing out a quick summary. The president loved this wants this, didn't like that, etc. And then right into the sit room. And so to your specific question about those sessions, it was four years. I asked the team to do some calendar int on the back end of my tour. And it turned out that I, and I suspect it would be almost the same for you, spent 1,440 hours in the sit room in those four years. And you counted? Well, <laughs> at least the calendar counted. Okay, okay. I think it felt like more than it that. It felt like more. And, and, you know, actually, as I say that, I think back fondly to those times. There was, those were tough meetings. You know, you know, if it got to the sit room, it wasn't because it was easy. It was because there was really no good answer. You know, North Korea, Iran, Russia, China, cyber, AQI, et cetera. But what a privilege to be able to interact with professionals, civil servants, right, who were dedicating their lives to something bigger than any of us in ways that while we always didn't agree... We always had that, that common output and that common focus. And to me, it was the most rewarding and four years like of my life. we felt like a team, didn't we? Indeed. We really did. And Dennis, yeah. Dennis McDonough, the Deputy National Security Advisor for most of this period, really tried to shape us as one and of, did so successfully. Of all the people I interacted down there, I never met anyone so skilled at interpersonal dynamics. Dennis could take a mess, which meant ego and equity and authorities and all the things that agencies and departments would bring. He was a maestro at, you know, what would he say? Cabin that one. Cabin. And compartment that one. Cabin it meant. It's a bad idea. Right. But we're not going to say it that way. Why don't we dog ear that and come back to that later? <laughs> that means you're done talking. Just a wonderful way, though, to manage. And let's face it, you were a superstar if you were in that room. So no wallflowers, you know, no shy types, all type A's leaning in. And uh, he was... Uh, he was quite talented. Yeah. Let me make an observation, Robert, and see if this resonates with you. My sense during my career was that intelligence became more important over time. And it was obviously critically important during the Cold War, but post-Cold War, it, it has taken on even more importance. And it's a reflection of the number of national security threats and challenges we face and the fact that many of those are first and foremost intelligence issues, which you can't understand the issue without mm -hmm. intelligence. You can't make policy. You can't implement that policy without intelligence. Does that resonate with you? It does. It does. And I'll say, Michael, I'm quite concerned with where intelligence fits tomorrow. We live in a just a different era now. I mean, and, and think how quickly things have changed. And I mean, debates that that we now have about what is real and what is fake, we didn't have two, three, four years ago. I mean, we did at a broad level, but fundamentally, what's true is, is a harder and harder issue to convey to people. And one of the things, Michael, I don't want to get too off topic here just yet, but I do want to speak about the issue. Because they're more skeptical? Well, or? it's two things. It's one, I think the nature of the world's connectivity. And, you know, I have a view that... The way the world digitized in the late 90s, early 2000s was clearly a huge boon to most of humanity from efficiency and productivity and education and communication. I mean, just the world just became a better place because of it. And yet I do believe now we're staring at the dark side of that connection and that nefarious actors or manipulators or confusers or anybody who wants to sow doubt at the point of decision can do so much more easily than they could before. We've created more surfaces of vulnerability. I think so. Yeah. And Michael, I, I think you'd agree, the way we got into room with a policymaker to have our moment of intelligence provision was mostly on the basis of credibility. Okay, I may not like what Michael's about to brief me, I may not even agree with it, but I know where he's coming from. I know the pedigree of the information that he is bringing to me. I know the tradecraft that he applied. So there's a trust there. And I got to tell you, I have a big issue with the term of art that's flying around these days called artificial intelligence. And 
imagine walking into the Oval and saying, Mr. President, we've got imagery that says this and signals that say this, and we have a human source that says, oh, by the way, let me offer you a little artificial intelligence to tell you. Oh, really? Which part of that is artificial? Which part did you fabricate? You know, I mean, which is real? Now, I'm well aware that it's a term, and, you know, you can think of it as deep learning and computer visioning and all the things we've done in the past as well. But I do worry about that credibility quotient that I think is fundamental to our ethos and fundamental to our ability as intelligence professionals to be welcomed in the room. And so your question about is intelligence more important, I do think yes. And I think the bar is being raised as to how we have to sustain, no, we have to grow the service to sustain that relevance going forward. I would think, and I think you've actually said this publicly, one of the implications of what you're saying is that there always has to be a human analyst hmm. touching this stuff, right? Indeed. I've gotten a bit of trouble even with my own workforce because I have gone hard at the uh, the innovation in Silicon Valley and Austin and Boston, et cetera, to try to infuse that vibrant technical innovation that's happening in our commercial sphere to make sure we're leveraging it here, just as CIA has been doing for years. And in some cases, I've got a little bit out of front and talked about automation and and whatnot. And unfortunately, my workforce heard, ah, you're going to replace me. You know, the robots will arrive. And I've been in which I never had intended. And so the way I like to think of it now is that that automation, that deep learning needs to elevate the analyst so you can amplify the analysis. And that can only happen, I believe, with a human today. And one of the best ways to, I think, to explain it to the layperson is, oftentimes in intelligence, the answer lies in what isn't there. And it's very difficult for an algorithm to work through what isn't there. But for a human, it's intuitive that that's not right. That what, what is missing or what didn't happen tells me... As much as what, 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 is, what is there. there. So I foresee a long, long period of time in which we're going to continue to ride that human expertise on top of the augmentation, automation, right. et cetera. Right. right. When you were talking about trust, I was thinking you only get that with a human being, right, at the end of the day. I think so. Yeah. I think so. So the other job, Robert, I wanted to ask you about was you were the acting J-2 <laughs> which is the U.S. military's senior most intelligence officer. So I don't know if a civilian had been in that role before you or after you. Uh, have not. Um, I don't but, know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, but, but uh, it's the one and only. Yeah. How different was that? How different was briefing the chairman every morning from briefing the president? It's a great question. I haven't thought about it that way. Temporally, it was the year before. So this is, this is May 2009. Secretary Gates had just made a decision about changing out leadership in Afghanistan. He was sending General McChrystal forward. And General McChrystal was told, you can take whomever you'd like. And so he pointed to the J-2 at the time, General Flynn, and said, you're going with me. And because that was an out-of-cycle move, they hadn't had plans to replace the J-2. So Ron Burgess, my boss, called me and said, hey, I need to go to the Pentagon for a few days. Beware when your boss says, I need you to go somewhere for a few days. You were deputy director of DIA then? That's right. Uh, For analysis. So I was the analysis chief at DIA. And I said, sure, great, happy to do it. So I go over to the Pentagon, do a very quick turnover with General Flynn, and get into the seat Memorial Day weekend 2009. And I'd worked in and around the joint staff my life, so I kind of knew of the place. But now I'm in the belly of the beast. By far the best thing about that experience was one Admiral Mike Mullen about a good a leader as I've ever worked with, for, and around. Great touch, great common sense, great interpersonal skills. Even keeled, did not get, you know, too high or too low. So quite fortunate there. And you may know we've had some chairmen that didn't have those skills. And so I, I, was, I had that good fortune. Quick story, though. So I come in on that Friday, turn over. Come back on Saturday because, oh, by the way, every day is Monday on the joint staff. So there's no weekends or anything. So you go in on Saturday. But it's quieter. There's not as many meetings. And I'm trying to study up for Tuesday, the day after Memorial Day, because I don't want to let down the suits, right? I'm the first civilian. I want to do a really good job. And so I'm trying to read all the regs and procedures. Four or five o'clock, I decide I'm going to go home. So I'm driving home. I get a phone call from a friend in the car as I'm heading down Shirley Highway. And he says, so how was your first day as being the first civilian J-2? And I said, uh, Kim Jong-il, who was the commander of North Korea at the time, must know I'm in charge because he hasn't done anything all day. 
Well, that's like four or five o'clock in the afternoon. I kid you, this is, I'm not making this up. So I go home, I turn on Sports Center, right? I'm a American male, so I'm watching something on Sports Center. And across the ticker around 9 p.m. comes a news alert on ESPN. You know you're in trouble when it's a news alert, not a score update. What the news alerts say? Seismic event on Korean Peninsula. And I go, hmm, that's bad for somebody. Phones no, start ringing. That would be you. <laughs> that would be Phones you. Phones start ringing. <laughs> so I get the first phone call around 9.30 or so, and they say the chairman will be in at 4 a.m. because the chairman is scheduled to be on every talk show in America Sunday morning because it's Memorial Day weekend. And that's what he does. He goes and he pays homage to those who have come before us. And you're going to prepare him for these Sunday shows for all these questions he's going to get about that seismic event. And I go, oh, OK, 4 a.m. Uh, let me get a couple hours sleep. Uh, go in at one. I'll get prepped. Hour goes by. The phone rings. They go, the vice chairman, Hoss Cartwright, he's coming in at 2 a.m. I go, oh, Lord, forget it. I'm just going in. Right. So we go in and. I don't know, Michael, I hope to not disappoint the American public, but in the early aftermath of those seismic events, we don't know a whole lot other than there was a seismic event. It was of this magnitude. It was in this region. And we have a bunch of hypotheses about what it could mean, but we don't have much. So I meet General Cartwright first, who's a very, very tough, demanding intelligence customer, and he wants to know everything, right? He, uh, he knows what the questions to ask. Oh, yeah. And he, and, right. He knows about the science behind it, and he knows about everything underneath it. So very, very demanding. So that goes frustratingly. And then Admiral Mullen comes in, and I tell him, and he kind of goes, okay, got it. I mean, he was kind of easygoing. So anyway, my... Opening night was, uh, or opening morning as the J-2 was uneven, uh, but I will say I ended up spending the summer there through Labor Day before Mike Rogers succeeded me. And to get back to your question, I found the chairman to be a, very similar in many ways to President Obama, even though I didn't know it at the time. Very thoughtful, very strategic, very rarely took you down. I think General Cartwright would take you down into the weeds where he was expert. Admiral Mullen was always thinking about a month, a year, five years out. And so I think in, in that way, it gave me good prep for what mm -hmm. came the next summer. Mm -hmm. So, Robert, let's switch, if we can, to the agency you now run, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA. It's not, not a well-known U.S. government agency in the heartland of America. It is in St. Louis, but not in Akron, Ohio, where I come from. So, for the listeners, what does NGA do? Sure. How does it fit into the intelligence community? How should they think about it? Sure. I think the best way to summarize what the nation gets back for its investment in NGA is through our vision statement, which is that we know the earth, we show the way, and we understand the world. And let me take them in those three chunks. We have geodesy, geomatic, gravity, scientists and specialists, PhDs that know this planet like no one else. So we are able to create a foundation of information upon which everything else fits. So whether you're mapping or you're charting or you're navigating, etc., we're the basis for that understanding. But the show the way piece is that navigation. And so it isn't enough to know what that particular point on the globe is. How do I safely move from that point to the other point, whether it's by air, sea, or land? Our responsibility is to the Department of Defense to do that. Because the Department of Defense tends to be a global enterprise, we have to do it everywhere. And so we are expert at precision location, precision engagement, navigational monitoring and warning, whether it be at sea or the air. And then finally, we move to our intelligence site, and that's understand the world. So if you think of the frame that I drew into the first piece and the locational services that we provide in the second piece, the third piece is how can we help not just understand what has happened or what is happening, but what will happen. And so in this part, predominantly, we're an enabling service for our colleagues at Langley, at uh, DIA, at NSA, to frame what is often a chaotic, incoherent picture about what's going on and create some sort of synthesis, some sort of insight to give that decision maker just a little bit of advantage at their point of decision. We just had the 55th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm -hmm. and uh, that was done by the predecessor. My predecessor, right. Right, exactly. Art Lundahl. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'd love to. We obviously celebrated it here. And if I, you know, I've had uh, an opportunity under DNI Coates to brief President Trump and his team to answer the question you just asked in a more holistic way. What is this geo thing and how does it benefit me? And the way we explained it to him and his team was to use Korea because it's a way that we can show off our capabilities and our insight and tools that we have at our disposal. Part of that story, though, was to say, 
We have airborne capability today that flies over South Korea and looks into North Korea to have some understanding about order of battle and movements, etc. That platform that flew this morning over the DMZ and looked into North Korea is basically the same platform that the Wizards of Langley invented 57 years ago in the mid-50s, this being the U-2, to create insight into the Soviet Union when President Eisenhower at the time couldn't get access to an understanding of their missile capability. So there's great connective tissue here. One, think of the scientific innovation that allows us to take an invention that's almost 60 years old now and still use it through software and technology. So that's to the American credit. But two, the same way that Art Lundahl, who ran the, what was called the National Photographic Interpretation Center, put photographs on President Kennedy's desk that showed a mobile missile so you're a successor to him. That's right. That's right. He, his organization is a legacy organization to ours. In the same way that Art dropped pictures on President Kennedy's desk showing him the threat of nuclear-tipped mobile missiles in Cuba, it's the same way that I have a responsibility to show President Trump and his team and General Mattis nuclear-tipped mobile missile threat in Korea. And even though it's been 55 years since that crisis, our responsibility hasn't changed. We owe them time and space, time to make the decision, space to take the action, and that hasn't changed. You're not the only intelligence collector, right? I mean, you're not the collector, NRO is the collector, but you, you manage that whole thing, That's right? right. And your, your analysts do the assessment of the product, and you're essentially one of three, right? So there's imagery and the analysis that goes with it, which is what you do. Mm -hmm. And there's the human intelligence is what CIA does. And then there's the signals intelligence that NSA does. And it all comes together. That's right. Right. But you're one of the three legs. Indeed. And I will say, Michael, though, that there's also something quite interesting going on around this part of our intel community. Remember, we talked about the digitization of the planet that caused NSA to reinvent itself. NSA literally had to reinvent its business model. In many ways, we're going through a similar sort of transformation here at NGA because when I got that letter from DIA offering me that $11,000, we had a monopoly on imagery from space. No, you don't anymore. We don't anymore. And so if we can't find a way to harness a different kind of digitization and this kind of sensing of the planet in a way that can provide time and space to decision makers, relevance is at risk here. So part of my tenure here at NGA has been to open up what I thought was a bit too insular of an approach. It came from a good place, but it was very protective. And I thought that that protection was keeping out yeah. ideas and capabilities. You know, I come from the most insular of, of, of places, right? The bin Laden hmm. operation. When Dr. Panetta first briefed President Obama, President Obama gave, gave an order, right? Which was, don't tell anybody, mm-hmm. except those you absolutely have to. Mm-hmm. And one of those places was NSA, and one of those places was NGA. Mm-hmm. Absolutely a critical part of the team. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So I was in the other job. Tish Long, my predecessor, was here at NGA leading. And, you know, you talked earlier about the, the three legs. Clearly a human driven case was being made, right? Connections through debriefings, interrogations, exquisite tradecraft, etc. That then led us to a facility that became suspicious that could be associated with bin Laden. It then turned all of the capabilities that NGA had in a very compartmented way, because even though some people at NGA had to know, you had to keep the fact that of the, even the theory of the case, very close closely held, we had to develop more insight because in addition, President Obama kept demanding, rightfully, I need more evidence. What's going on inside that compound? It's not enough. This is this is quite a big bet here. And uh, I need to have more intelligence. And so I think NGA, I think NSA, I think CIA, I would argue, Michael, and of course you were there as well. You know, I can't think of an operation of a analytic collection, analytic engagement of which I could be more proud because it was one of utmost import, right? No question about that. Two, highly pressurized, right? There was enormous pressure on everyone to get it right. Three, you know, as you said, no one wanted to let anyone else down, right? Everyone was working overtime and over strength and just continually trying to pour over every bit of information we could get. And at the end of the day, it was still an assessment. You know, it was an assessment. It was not, we know this. 
you know, and, and you were there for all the fun with numbers and all that about percentages. But what, I, what I'm most proud of is that we as an IC did our job with respect to we made the case. And by the way, we did not sugarcoat it. You know, this is what it is and this is what it isn't. Here's all the reasons why it might not be right. But we enabled the leadership, but ultimately the president, to make a very tough call, which we forget looking in hindsight. Oh, yeah, he was there. It was easy. No, we didn't know that. What's interesting to me, Robert, is there's a thread here that goes back to the way this conversation started, right, which Jim Clapper bringing together, integrating, right? And that's exactly what happened. I think that's right. We integrated three of the most significant intelligence agencies to go do this. I think that's right. Yeah. And, and you know, people say, you know, have we learned our 9-11 lesson and WMD lesson? And I would say, one, yes, that's an example. I'd also say, Michael, that what the community did in August of 2013 after Assad's use of chemical weapons in Syria was another great example that we had learned our lesson. Because that's another example of WMD. And there was the possibility that we would be going to a new war with another country in the Middle East. And so all those ghosts came back up. And again, at that time, I was responsible for what went into the PDB. Very proud of what we wrote within 24 hours. We didn't know everything, but we put it we got it about right. And as we got additional intelligence, much of it derived from great networks that the CIA had developed, we built the case. You and remember we started out at low confidence. Of course. And then slowly over time, yeah, went up and up. And I remember going to the Hill with Dennis, and I think with you at times, and we were making the case because, you know, as the president, he sent the request to the Hill. And so we had to go make the case. And I, I remember starting those briefings, very hostile audience, very hostile. Oh, here you are again. Yeah. You're the people that told us about Saddam and this and that. You're, you're here again to mislead us. Eight minutes later, lay out the case. They're yelling about the policy. Good. Go have your policy debate. Go have your what do we do about it. But the intelligence case, we got it right. And so we are a much healthier community. We are, we've got our issues, of course, way more integrated. If I could... Uh, throw some credit to Admiral McConnell's way. Joint duty is a wonderful thing. And uh, the fact that we are moving our people around. Yeah, for the listeners, joint duty is... Yeah, it's now a requirement. Admiral McConnell, who was our second DNI, Director of National Intelligence, instituted a policy that in order to be promoted to our senior ranks, you had to have what's called joint duty credit. Something built upon Goldwater Nichols and the joint duty nature of what the armed services have gone through. But it's a great model. Serve somewhere else, get deep experience someplace else. Yeah. That's the idea, right? I met some of our young officers last night and they say, well, you know, how do you get ahead around here? And I said, go, get out, go. Don't leave tomorrow, but go get experience. Go, go sit in a policy job, you know, go work down at the NSC in, this, in the crisis room and, uh, or go work at Treasury. It's a broadening that I think will infuse your ability to provide your core service when you come back. So much healthier community. One more thought on uh, the bin Laden operation. NGA used its geospatial capabilities to mm -hmm. build a, a to scale model Indeed. of the compound, which is, is upstairs in one of your museums. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So going back to the National Photographic Interpretation Center, we've always had a capability to build scale models. In the old days, it was required because that was the only way you could truly represent something in 3D, right? If you wanted to show the president a silo or a submarine, you would have to literally carve it or scale it and, and weld it and build it. Today, obviously, with 3D printers, we have a lot more capabilities to do that. But in this case, the model was important for two reasons. One, it was necessary in the sit room or the oval, wherever, because it was used to help make the case or explain the case. We now know this about this part of the house or this activity or this is what's happening to help the president digest. The second model was to go to those who may be directed to go execute the mission for rehearsal. And so we built them both for, for those reasons. And matter of fact, we're quite proud that the 9-11 Museum in New York has asked to borrow the model for an exhibit they're going to put up next summer that is the rest of the 9-11 story, of which we're proud of our, of our role. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. And the one you have here mm -hmm. at NGA is the one that we used in the sit room. That's correct. And there's one at CIA that was used for the forces that That's uh, correct. that executed the mission. Right. So, Robert, you've talked publicly about the importance of a partnership between NGA and the private sector. What are you, what are you thinking? Um, what does NGA get out of it? What does the private sector get out of it? Sort yeah. that for me. It's a good question. We're wrestling with it now to include with our friends on the Hill. But here's the basic value proposition. NGA is only 21 years old, but as we just discussed with Art Lundahl and NPIC, 
We have decades of data here in the building, literally archives of imagery and uh, geodetic information about the planet. We believe that in the era of deep learning, computer visioning, artificial intelligence, the coin of the realm is data, especially labeled data, that can feed the algorithms to train them so that they can learn and create additional value. I don't have an excess of data scientists in algorithmic developments, but I do have an excess of data, especially labeled data. The proposition is this, is there a possibility that I could trade? And now that's, that's, a, that's a big term. This is where Congress gets very interested. What do you mean trade? Who gets the license? Who gets to own it for how long, et cetera? A lot to be worked out. But the big value proposition is, can I trade that data for your algorithmic expertise? What I get back is that expertise to apply not just to that data, but to data that I'm not gonna share with you because of its classification or sensitivity. What you get as a company is you get a much smarter algorithm and you can go sell more sneakers or coffee or real estate, whatever it is you want to do. And so that's the basic proposition. Uh, we've talked to the Hill about getting the authorities to set up such an exchange. Have you talked to the private sector? We have. Matter of fact, I'll be talking with an entity that you're very familiar with called InQtel, which is a CIA entity that had the same basic idea, just with money, vice data. Right. Where do you make investments in order to get a return on right. that investment? Right. And so uh, InQtel may be a way forward for us here. But we think there's strong, I mean, and when I talk to the, the administration or the department, the taxpayers have paid for this data. It's here. Now, my job is to protect it and care for it and and manage it, but I'd like to advance American ingenuity and innovation with American data. Yes, I'd like to get some advantage back so that I can apply it against an adversary and keep us safe. To me, it feels like a win-win-win. But again, my lawyers tell me it's a yeah. little more harder than so. So, so one way to think about this, right, is the taxpayers have paid for it, as you said, already paid for it, and the taxpayers have got value for it once mm -hmm. when you acquired it and used it mm -hmm. for whatever purpose. Right. Um, and you're saying, well, I think I can get a second value here for the taxpayers. I do. Right? Yeah. Right? Cool, Robert. You've been extraordinarily generous with your time. I just wanted to ask you two final questions. One is, what do you want my listeners, what do you want Americans to know about the women and men who work here at NGA? You said earlier that we're not an above-the-fold agency. We're not one of those three letters that you often see. It's actually a good thing. I know that. <laughs> At times. I know that. But there's no TV shows about right. us and all that. And, that. and that is a good thing. So I would like the American people to know that there are selfless, hardworking patriots that toil in relative obscurity for one reason, and that's for a cause higher than themselves, and that they take great pride when that ship arrives safely and that plane lands safely, and that soldier gets back from harm's way. And we do so, again, without a lot of fanfare. We do so with great pride, though. And we're also quite excited about how we can evolve this mission using the reality of what's happening in the economy and this really explosion in geospatial capability around us in ways that will both prosper America in ways we just discussed, but also secure the country and its interests. And then what would you want Americans to know about the intelligence community? And I know it would be similar, right? But given your very significant role at DNI for four years. Yeah, I guess, you know, we talked about, I'll we'll call it a trough that we were in, you know, post 9-11, post m and there was kind of a pall on our community. Where do these guys get anything right? Have they been politicized? Are they spinning things and whatnot? And I won't say you don't ever hear that these days. Of course you do. But in great measure, I think we've earned back that trust. But if we assume it for a second, we risk it going forward. And so what I would tell the American people is that while we're proud of what we do for this country, we're not resting on today's, much less yesterday's laurels. We're continually trying to reinvent ourselves because as the world flattens and as capabilities become more commonly available, we're well aware that the adversary's gaining advantage and that the delta between our capabilities and theirs is and has narrowed. Thus, we know we must be better. And so... I would tell the American people that we, we are proud that we have re-earned that trust, but we're going to work even harder to sustain it going forward. Robert, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Michael. That was Robert Cardillo, and this is Intelligence Matters. Please join us next time. Please take the time to give us your feedback on iTunes, and please visit the Cypher Brief website for in-depth analysis on the entire range of national security issues. And most important, thanks for listening.